If you recall in the news recently, General Motors is also the company that builds cars and is building respirators for our current fight of the coronavirus. In order to talk about this airplane though, I'm gonna get in it because there's a characteristic here that is really quite unique. So bear with me here for a second. All right, this is cool. I wish you were in here with me. Let me turn on a light. There you go. All right, this is a fighter plane. This is exactly what a fighter pilot wants. First off, it is compact, it is close. When I get in this airplane, I'm not getting into a space, I'm putting this airplane on. I become part of this airplane. The canopy rails are tight, the visibility is great all around. Remember up until this airplane, most of our fighters had uh, two wings, were called a biplane. So we would have visibility limited up above us and we'd have to work around that. Not the case here. My visibility is great. Left, right, up, down, and back. About the only place where I have some limited visibility is characteristic of most fighters, and that is down, low, and behind. So look at this cockpit. Everything I need to know about the status of flight is right up in front of me. It is compact. It is tight. I don't have to scan very far to know everything I want to know about altitude, airspeed, rate of climb, or how the engine is doing. It's all right here. This is a fighter plane. And the primary uh, weapon system here was a 50 caliber gun. A 50 caliber gun shoots this kind of shell. We'll be talking more about this in a little bit, but this airplane had four of these guns. And in order to get the gun to shoot, all he had to do was throw four switches on his right hand forward and pull the trigger, which was right underneath the trigger finger on the stick. This is one of the things I really like. The gun sight is directly in front of my head, directly in front of my eyes. Anytime I look forward, I know exactly where those guns are pointing and exactly where I need to point the airplane to get the guns to where I need them. This is the gun sight. It is my major place where I go to business in this fighter plane to manage the fighter system, the weapon system, everything I need is over here on the left. If I want to trim for rudder or roll or for pitch, it's all within about six inches right here, easily done. My throttle right under the left hand, mixture control, propeller control, right handy here. I don't even have to look at it to find it. And this is really cool. I have a two-stage boost or, or a, a, a booster for the engine so that I can ram more air into those cylinders at altitude to get more power to that airplane, to get more power out of that engine. Down below here, a little bit harder to reach, is my, bomb, is my bomb release. All right, so now I'm in this fighter plane. I am part of this airplane. I'm looking forward. In front of me, I have a great engine. I have a rugged engine and a rugged airplane. The engine on this airplane is a Pratt & Whitney 1830 and there were over 170,000 of those engines made. They were used on all kinds of aircraft. So that airplane is rugged, it's repairable, it's reliable, 
and it's the kind of engine I want to go, want to have if I go in combat. You want that engine to be powerful and stay with you. The other thing about it, the airplane is rugged. I have armor protection behind me to protect me, and I have self-sealing gas tanks that we're going to talk about that help me keep my gasoline if someone punches a hole in them. This airplane was built as a fighter. It was flown by fighter pilots and it was designed from the point of the propeller to the tail from wingtip to wingtip to be a fighter airplane. And we were very fortunate to have it. Now, in order to tell the whole story of the Wildcat, you and I need to take a walk. We have three wildcats in this museum, one here on the floor that I'm sitting in, one suspended, and then two of the others are suspended. What I want to do is walk from this airplane to the other airplane, so bear with me while I climb out of the cockpit and Donald gets down to the floor. We're going to continue the story of the wildcat as we go from one airplane to the next. was attacked in December of 1941. It decimated our Pacific fleet. The carriers and the carrier aircraft were not in Pearl Harbor at that time. They were out to sea. And those carriers were part of our thrust back into the Pacific during, the, uh, during 1942. The day after Pearl Harbor, Wake Island was attacked. The fighters that the Marine contingent had at Wake Island were wildcats. They fought bravely and they fought nobly, but Wake Island fell. In May of 1942, there was the Battle of Coral Sea, the first big carrier v. carrier fight, and the fighters that we had in the Navy at that time were the wildcats. In June of 1942, there was the uh, Battle of Midway, a massive battle in which the tide of the war changed. The fighters that we had escorting our bombers and fighting the enemy in the sky, again, was the Wildcat. Later on in 42, in November, we had Guadalcanal, a huge battle for control in the Central Pacific, in the Southern Pacific. The Wildcat performed splendidly. It had an amazing record. It achieved almost seven to one. It was 6.9 to one kill ratio. What that means is for every one we lost in combat, we were able to shoot down 6.9 aircraft. Of all of our aces, there were 61 aces that became aces, shot five or more aircraft down, 61 flew the Hellcat. If you come to our museum, when you come, you're gonna have a chance to see our Medal of Honor wall. These are naval aviators who won the Medal of Honor. Eight of these aviators flew the Wildcat. You have people like Bear, who won the Medal of Honor for his efforts at Guadalcanal. You have people like Elrod. Elrod won the Medal of Honor for his efforts at Wake Island. You have people like Joe Foss, Guadalcanal. Robert Gaylor, Guadalcanal. You have Lieutenant Ball. He flew in the Coral Sea. He flew in the Coral Sea the Battle of Coral Sea, and you have a very famous aviator by the name of Butch O'Hare, who also flew in the Battle of the Coral Sea. He's the gentleman that O'Hare Airport is named after in Chicago. 
Now, so we have this amazing airplane doing amazing things, making amazing achievements at critical times, but to fully understand how important and big that was, we need to take a little bit farther of a walk here, and I, I want you to stay with me as we go past the Blue Angel display, because the Wildcat actually has a tie to the Blue Angels. The first commander of the Blue Angels was a guy by the name of uh, Butch Voris, and he had been a Wildcat pilot in the Battle of Coral Sea, flying for a gentleman by the name of Lieutenant Commander Flatley, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. The third commander of the Blue Angels was a guy named Dusky Rhodes, and he also had flown with Commander Flatley in the Battle of the Coral Sea. So both of these, these two Blue Angel pilots uh, in the early days of the Blue Angels had been in battle in this amazing airplane. So here's the display that I wanted to bring you to. Here are the two aircraft that bumped heads day in and day out, the two fighter plane opponents. On the right, you have the Grumman F4F. And here on the left, you have the Mitsubishi A6M Zero. Now here's the irony. With the exception of only a couple of points, this airplane, this Zero, could do absolutely everything better than our Wildcat. The Zero weighed less. In fact, the Zero, its maximum flying weight, its maximum gross weight, was about the same as the empty weight of the Wildcat before you even put any gas, ammunition, or pilot plane. The Wildcat had a slightly bigger engine, but that engine, that horsepower, was required in order to pull a heavier aircraft. They both had about the same top speed with a very, very slight advantage, again, going to the Zero. The Zero carried more gas. It could go farther. It had a longer range than the Wildcat, which is another huge advantage. The Zero could outturn and could establish a higher rate of climb than the Wildcat could. Now, if you're going to be a fighter pilot and you're going to fight, fight another aircraft in close quarters, Having the ability to outturn and outclimb your opponent is a huge advantage. And there's one other advantage that the Zero had that is that cannot go unstated and was huge. The Zero had been at war for two and sometimes three years already. They had hundreds of hours, hundreds of hours of combat time our Wildcat pilots had been at war and been in combat for less than six months. That was a huge advantage for the So now, I spent roughly 20 minutes telling you how great the Wildcat is, and now I'm telling you that the Wildcat wasn't anywhere near as good as the airplane that it had to fight. This should, this should create a question in your mind. How in the world can this be? Well, the pilots in the Navy and the Marine Corps were wrestling with the same challenge. How do we do this? How do we fight this airplane? And there's two things that occurred that are incredibly important. One was in tactics, 
and the other was in our ability to learn more about the airplane. And I'm going to start to explain how we were able to fight that airplane with our Wildcat. Let me talk about tactics first. One of our great tacticians in World War II in air combat was a guy named Jimmy Thatch. Thatch had been in the Battle of Coral Sea, and he, like Flatley, they were pretty tired of fighting the Zero and having to deal with all of the advantages that the Zero had. So the story has it that Jimmy Thatch was at a table working with matchsticks, trying to figure out how do we take our formations, because it doesn't matter what we do, we're always defensive. So he would lay out the matchsticks with the formations we would use and the formations that the Japanese would use. So at the time, it, early on in the war, what we would do is fly a finger four like this or a three V, all right? The Japanese would typically be in three plane formations staggered like this. And what they would do is an abeam attack. The favorite attack was an abeam attack. As soon as we started maneuvering, the zeros were in there and in close, and now we had a problem. He's laying out these matchsticks, trying to figure out how everybody moves and how everybody can get, can get in position. They are started defensively, and that's not the way you want to do this because their opponent could outturn us. What if we change things up a little bit? What if instead of flying this finger formation or this V, what if we fly a combat spread, as we would call it today, a defensive spread, and as soon as the attack comes, we turn into each other with our aircraft and see what the Japanese do. If the Japanese aircraft go for these aircraft, they'll be defensive against these aircraft. If the Japanese aircraft turn with these, with these aircraft, they'll be defensive with these aircraft. It became known, his name was Jimmy Thatch, it became known as the Thatch weave and it was an amazing insight and it was tremendously effective in a very short period of time. Remember I mentioned uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Flatley? After the Battle of Coral Sea he said, he said don't dogfight with the Zero. You'll get shot down. The Zero is a superior fighter. When he and Jimmy Thatch started training with their, what they learned with these matchsticks, that changed by, <coughs> excuse me, by midway, this was turning, the, this was turning the tables on the Japanese, so much so that flatly wrote, here's a declassified confidential paper written by uh, James Flatley, and he says, quote, the thatch weave, which is offensive as well as defensive, has, was as conceived by Lieutenant Commander J.S. Thatch. It is undoubtedly the greatest contribution to air combat tactics that has been, uh, been made to date. He goes on in these dispatches to explain how he personally has used these tactics to great success in his own combat experience. This worked. This changed the tide. At this point, our aircraft could start offensive and maintain an offensive position. That's huge. Now, I said there were two things. The other thing that happened, it was a result of a Japanese attack in the uh, islands off the coast of Alaska. In June of 1942, 
the Japanese attacked uh, an Aleutian Island, uh, a portion of the Aleutian Islands called Dutch Harbor. And there was a zero pilot by the name of Petty Officer Koga. Koga was doing a strafing attack with his zero and one of the uh, bullets from ground fire nicked an oil line. He was losing oil pressure. He could not go back to the ship. He diverted to a, another uh, island in the Aleutian chain. He attempted an emergency landing, and he did a pretty good job, actually, except he landed on a bog. The airplane slowed down way too fast. It flipped over, and he died in that crash. However, the airplane was largely intact. There was a patrol of a PBY that happened to see this aircraft upside down in a bog, and they sounded the alarm. They said, hey, we can get this zero. There's a zero upside down on this island. We recovered it. We took it to San Diego. We repaired it, and then we started test flying. We started figuring out what this airplane could and could not do, and guess what? We found some weaknesses in the Zero that we were able to exploit in our fight with our aircraft. If you look at the Zero over here, and I don't have my pointer, but it, the aircraft has very large control surfaces for its weight, it made it very maneuverable at slower or combat speeds. However, those large control surfaces had an aerodynamic load that made it hard to overcome at high speeds. Here's the result. That aircraft, the Zero, was difficult to roll at very high speeds, especially to the right. So automatically now, if a, if a Wildcat found itself defensive, look at me, what that air, Wildcat could do is roll inverted very quickly and continue rolling to the right, which means that the Zero would come in there, have difficulty following him, and would either have to break off the attack or would end up outside the, the uh, Wildcat's flight path. That was huge. That was huge. We suddenly had a way to defend ourselves against that aircraft in a very quick and dynamic way. The other, th some other weaknesses, the airplane, remember I said that the Wildcat had armor. It protected the pilot. Not so on the Zero. No armor. The, ar the bullets could go right through it and get to the pilot. Look at the top of the uh, look at the top of the uh, 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 zero, and you see two little machine guns. Those machine guns shot bullets that were very much like this, 7.7 millimeter bullets. Now they they shot at a high rate of fire, a high cyclic rate, but that bullet isn't big enough to do a lot of damage unless it hits something critical. And so this is on the Japanese, uh, Japanese aircraft. The other thing it had in the wings were these things. It was a 20 millimeter projectile, but it had a very low rate of fire. And because of that, the pilot had to pull a lot of lead, which, uh, which meant that as long as the Wildcat was maneuvering, it was very, very hard for that Zero to, to saddle up or track the, uh, the Wildcat for shooting. Remember the Wildcat had 50 caliber guns. In fact, as it had four, 50 caliber guns. It would shoot these bullets. It would shoot these bullets, each gun at the rate of between 700, uh, 750 and 850 rounds per minute. So if you do the math, remember there's four guns shooting, if he selected all four, in just a second, he's putting 60 bullets out there. If he pulled the trigger for two seconds, he's putting over 100 bullets where he was looking straight through that gun sight.
Now, there's one other thing that I want to talk about, and it's really hard to understand, but it's very, very important. And I've mentioned the self-sealing gas tanks. There were no self-sealing gas tanks here. It, they were just the metal tanks that were sealed. But in the Wildcat, we had fuel bladders. We had self-sealing material that would give way for a bullet when a bullet went through it, but then close up behind it. So I built a model gas tank here for you to try to explain this. On one side, I have this material, the sealant. On the other side, I have none. And what I have done is punched an eighth inch hole with this awl on both sides through the sealant and through this tank. On the Japanese aircraft, if, you, if you're flying along and you get a hole, the gas is coming out. On the Wildcat, same size hole, same size projectile, went through just as deep and it closes up behind, which means that this rugged airplane, you can get it back home, you can patch it up, you can glue it up, you can fix it up and throw it back into the battle. This was a huge advantage that is not widely understood because you want this, not this. All right, so I told you that this was a very important airplane, and it was. It was the airplane we had when we had to go and face a very, very difficult challenge in the Pacific. It had, I also told you that it had some performance uh, challenges in the face of the enemy it had to fight, and it did. But the importance of the story that I want you to remember is the airplane we had, are we back on here? Okay. The airplane that we had was flown by courageous, innovative, tremendous pilots who adapted and they overcame and in doing so they were able to protect our fleet they were able to protect our aircraft they were able to carry the fight forward as we marched into the Pacific that all happened in about two years this aircraft was only in service about two years today aircraft are in service for 20 years this was in service for only about two years, and it was one of the most important fighter planes the Navy and the Marine Corps ever had. I look forward to your questions about the Wildcat. So we do have some really great, great questions today, and one comes from Samia, who tunes in to our episodes of History Up Close Live. So thank you, Samia. And he says, how many Zero Fighters were made in the world? You know, I don't know, but it would have been in the thousands. It would have been in the, in the thousands. That number is probably available somewhere. I apologize. I don't know how many were made total. There were variants of the Zero, just like there were variants of the Wildcat. But the, the Zero didn't change that much. Uh, over the course of the war. Next week, you're going to learn about the airplane that replaced the Wildcat, and now suddenly we had a huge advantage over a Zero fighter that had not changed very much. Frank Rizzo says, why was the Zero difficult to roll to the right? Was it due to the engine rotation? Okay, so while there may have been a gyroscopic force, the major reason was the aerodynamic load on the huge control flight surfaces. If you look at the Zero and you look at the uh, uh, Wildcat, the, the aileron, the roll control, the surface that controls roll is over twice as big on the Zero as it is on the Wildcat. Now, that sounds great, and it is great at slow speed, but at high speed, it creates a force you have to overcome, which was difficult to do. 
So Kelly asks, where did the name Wildcat come from? Great. So the, the aircraft, the aircraft from Grumman uh, were all named after cats. You're going to hear more about the Grumman cats as we go into our presentations. This one was called the Wildcat. So Tom says, he, and, and we talked a little bit about this, but can you speak to the armor that was around the pilot? Was this typical armament for that eight, for that time period? Well, the armament was typical, but more, more importantly, and I'm gonna step out here a little bit, it would protect the pilot from the projectiles coming to the, to the airplane. So if the airplane could be brought back and the pilot was still alive, that armament was incredibly important. If there was no armament and there was no self-sealing tanks, now all of a sudden any hit is a good hit. They're going to be losing fuel or injuring the pilot regardless of where the bullets go. Tom also says, what was the cruising range of the Wildcat? Okay, so the Wildcat uh, had a range of about 830 miles, about 830 miles. The Zero could actually go about 150 miles farther, which was another huge advantage for the Zero because it could stay outside the reach of the Wildcat by outranging the Wildcat. Michael Greco says, can you speak to Japan's loss of many of their very experienced pilots during Midway and their inability to train the new ones like we could? All right, that's a great observation. There was another huge advantage for the, for the Allied forces that developed over time. The Japanese, by necessity and by choice, threw their best and brightest pilots against the challenge over and over and over. In the United States, we started training, we trained hard. Some of our best pilots went into flight instruction. I personally know a World War II pilot that spent more time, a combat pilot, that spent more time training in the Navy Training Command, teaching pilots how to fly, than he did fighting because he was considered so valuable to transfer knowledge as we built this force that we would use in the Pacific to complete that war. So I guess the bottom line, and I'm sorry, over time the Japanese lost some of their best pilots and had trouble replacing them. Over time we built a force of bigger and better pilots as we went, and better as we went into the war. David says the Wildcat landing gear looks far less rugged than the Hellcat. Was it really less rugged or does it just appear that way? It probably was a little less rugged. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to compare the two directly, but you remember a couple of weeks ago when I had uh, Rio cranking the gear on the F3F? It was the same way to get that gear up in this Wildcat. That's one thing that probably wasn't as good as it could have been, but it worked. By the time we replaced that aircraft, we had hydraulic gear. How many cranks did it take? 26 by <laughs> one account, 28 by another. <laughs> Carlton says, do you do tours when the museum is open? You're so very knowledgeable. <laughs> we do tours. And you know what? I'm here doing this today, but I guarantee you there are a dozen people that know more stories about this museum than I do, and they're called our docents. If you ever have a chance to come to this museum, when you have a chance to come back to this museum, Take the time and come through this incredible museum with our docents because they can, they can enrich your knowledge for life with all the stories they have about incredible aircraft and the incredible people who flew them. So I've got time for one other question here and it comes from Jeff. And he says, 
What was the ceiling fuel tank made of? Was it more of the fact that a, when a hole punched through the rubber, it stayed small, or did the rubber actually seal back together? Yeah, let me show that to you. Here's the material that I'm talking about. So I'm gonna put an, a one eighth inch hole through it, all right? So there's, a one, there's about a one eighth inch hole. That's as big as the hole right here. You see? All right, when I pull it out, in other words, when the bullet goes through, it closes up behind. So self-sealing is probably not the right word in the sense that it, it doesn't automatically seal. What it does is it closes up behind the penetration and then when you have pressure coming against it, it stops things from leaking. Even though there's a hole. Great question. Listen. I enjoyed being with you today. I guess we had some technical difficulties. I hope you enjoyed it. We look forward to bringing you many, many more of these programs. I'm gonna turn it over to back to Rio here, who's gonna close this out. Thank you. Hi guys. Thank you so much for joining us today for History Up Close Live on behalf of the National Naval Aviation Museum and our foundation. So next week, we are going to talk about the F6F Hellcat with Hill Goodspeed, our museum's historian. And that is Tuesday, May 5th at 11 a.m. Central Time. So join us next Tuesday with Hill to talk about the F6F Hellcat. Thanks again and everybody have a wonderful day.